We're back to the Beach Lifestyle celebrity segment on the Total Tutor Show. I'm the host of the show, Neil Haley, and I want to. I'm really excited to welcome the program uh, again. My first ever New England Patriot. But if you're going to talk about a superstar, you're going to talk about a three-time Pro Bowler, three-time Super Bowl champion. I want to welcome the program, Matt Light. Matt, how are you? I'm doing great. So uh, really excited. So basically, we can kind of talk about the story of your career in the first segment, then go to the foundation, which we really like to highlight. But Matt, how did you get involved with football? Was it something that was uh, always came second nature to you or just someone discover you? You know what? Uh, I, I had to think back to, you know, kind of Ohio, um, the area that I grew up in. I have to believe that it was just kind of the way that kids were raised back then. I mean, you know, I think I look at it now. I have four kids of my own, and I see you know kind of the different things that they get involved with. And there's far more opportunities, and you know everything else these days. But back then, I mean, look, you're a young kid, you're a young male, you're growing up, you played pee wee football. That's what you did, and that's what I did. And I like to you know run around and hit people. So what better sport for my parents to say, yeah, yeah, we'll take you there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like in Ohio or Pennsylvania, if you don't play football. Really, there's it's at one point in time, it's for, it's forget about it. It's pretty much the same deal, Ohio and Pennsylvania football. You're going to be involved in football in some sort of way, so you were involved in it. But when did you finally see, you know what, this might be a career? Well, you know what, I think, I think that comes different for everybody. For me, you know, literally play the game because I loved it. It was always fun, like everybody else starts out. And then it wasn't until probably my junior year that, you know, I started to get a little bit of interest from, you know, letters showing up in the mail, coaches saying things, people coming by practice. But, you know, look, I grew up in a very small farming community that, you know, really didn't, I didn't have anybody I could look up to to say, hey, I want to do what that guy did. Um, There was a guy that had gone to Wittenberg that was a year ahead of me, who is now our head football coach. Um, But, uh, you know, for the high school team back there now, but at the time he was literally the only guy that, I could look up to and say, hey, you know, you've been there. You've been through this process a little bit. Um, And so, you know, for me, it was basically got this awesome opportunity to go play at Purdue and and play in the Big Ten. And and it wasn't until probably towards the end of my college career that I started thinking that the pros, you know, could – you know, possibly be an option. Very interesting. So basically, when you were in high school, you weren't saying, I'm going to be the superstar, three-time Super Bowl champion. You never had that in your mindset. You were just playing football because you love football, it sounds like. Yeah, you know, and I think, honestly, I mean, everybody does it different, of course. You know, some guys grow up always, you know, saying that they're going to be that guy or whatever it is, right? And that just wasn't me. I mean, I was so entrenched with, you know, the way of life growing up in a small town and hunting and being outdoors and all that kind of stuff that, you know, football was something that I really enjoyed. I was good at it, you know, had success and all that kind of stuff. But I hadn't seen a professional game until I played in one. And that's that's even kind of college, you know. First time I saw a college football game, you know, I was playing in it. Same thing with the National Football League and any experience. I mean, you know, the Super Bowl that I played in my rookie year was the first, you know, time I had ever seen, a ha- you know, I didn't see a halftime show, but, you know, been a part of that whole process, you know. So um, for me, it was it was all new as it was happening. I mean, that, that's that's wild to know that. I guess that's why it's good we're learning about your background in outdoorsman, and we're going to talk about it in the next segment. But I think that, Ultimately, you were playing the sport, but yet it's not something you you ultimately watched all the time, and you didn't get the opportunity and the experience of doing that. So you said you were a small town. How big was your high school, by the way? You know what our 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 town was the county seat. So you know we I graduated with you know probably close to two hundred eighty kids in my class, um, which you know a lot of people say that's a fairly sizable school, but it's the only school you know, in the area. So, you know, when you, when you put it in that perspective, um, you know, again, it was a, it was a great community, a great town, a lot of, you know, a lot of pride in what we did and and who we were, but um, we definitely didn't have the tradition of being a powerhouse in football. I'm not sure we won more than four games ever in a season. So uh, yeah, you know, football was big, but um, you know, it definitely wasn't something that most of the kids grew up thinking, you know, this is what I'm going to do. This is who I am. So where in, where in Ohio did you grow up? I forgot to ask you about it. Uh, I grew up in Greenville, Ohio, which is basically West central Ohio. Um, You know, my, my personal house was, you know, not far from the border in Indiana. Um, Actually had a guy, you know, as far as other people from the area, you know, uh, Curtis Enos, who, you know, went on to Penn State, played in the Big Ten. 
um, he went to a school much smaller than ours, graduated with about 50 kids in his class, and was Mr. Football of Ohio. So, you know, had a little exposure to the guys and, and uh, you know, kind of the lifestyle and things of that nature. But, again, never really got into it. I was always more involved with, you know, friends and family, the outdoors and things of that nature. Very, very interesting. And so, basically, Greenville, Ohio is right on the border. So, a small town, but yet big town in a way because there's no other high schools in, in the vicinity. So, you you went ahead and took the scholarship at Purdue. Was that a huge change for you just to be part of college football? And I mean, the atmosphere, especially Purdue at that time and how big being in the Big Ten and the expectations and everything? Yeah, you know, it was. I mean, especially for a guy like me, you know, I get, I get there and as a true freshman end up, you know, starting a tight end and, and playing the tight end position, which was completely new for for me and uh, and learning that, you know, skilled side of it was, was interesting. But, yeah, you know, the, the whole transition was huge because we didn't really have, you know, we, we, we didn't do anything like you do at the college level, obviously, but we didn't, you know, train, you know, the way a lot of schools train now at the high school level. Um, so getting into a routine and going through the workouts and, you know, just the physical demand that that's put on you from a student athlete perspective and everything else was, a, was quite a shock. It, it definitely was in a way in the playbook and then the campus. It's a pretty, it's a large campus at Purdue and uh, to be able to balance athletics and academics. And it seemed like you were a pretty uh, strong willed individual being the outdoorsman and family. So academics were an important part of your life as well, right? And that's a, that, that's where the decision came down to go to Purdue. You know, I had a father, you know, I have a father that's uh, you know been an engineer his entire life and and run an engineering group, uh, uh, you know, not far from you know our hometown. So, you know, definitely grew up with uh, you know kind of that background, and and Purdue was a no brainer on that end. And, and really, honestly, you know, the, the professors don't care who you are uh, off the field, so to speak, um, or on the field. Um, they, they, they just want to know that you're there to learn and you're going to get it all done. So it was very demanding, you know, from, a, um, you know, from, from that end of it, that side of the equation wasn't, and, and you know, and, and not having a major that, you know, not, not, not to put any other majors down, but, you know, the, having a major is very demanding with the labs and everything else. I mean, it took a lot of time, but, you know, definitely someone took a lot of pride in, you know, be able to graduate in 2000, um, you know, with an industrial technology degree and, and kind of, you know, have that and, and then move on from that to go into the league, you know, that was a very fulfilling experience all around. So you were definitely what the NCAA would call a student athlete, sounds like. Not like, you know, certain, and especially picking a university like Purdue, you ha- the expectations. That's a very, you could basically do a talk on that alone to kids and say, you know what, when I went to Purdue, I was a student athlete, and student was the more important thing some of the universities aren't like that. And I'm sure you wish, especially when you were competing against some of those universities, we're not going to mention them, Matt, that the student was not part of the athlete component. So I think you were happy that you were in a place where that was the case. Well, you know, and I look, I mean, you know, everybody knows they're getting themselves into, you know, the, the many schools will not, you know, they're going to throw the academic side of it. They're going to throw the student side out there. You know, a lot. But at the end of the day, we all know that what's most important is the bottom line, winning games, and uh, and, and and that's going to take precedence over anything else. It's just the opposite of Purdue from that model, and that is, look, we're going to make sure that this young man that's walking into this system is going to become as good an athlete as he can, and he's going to have the opportunities, and he's going to have the facilities and everything else at the at literally the top notch. The, the, you, you won't find a better place. Than, than Purdue when it comes to the facilities and the investment they put in there for their student athletes. But, but the other side of it is that, hey, we're going to be far more impressed with his ability or her ability to leave this university being able to hang their hat on a degree that, you know, nobody can touch. You know, no, nobody can put it down. Nobody can say anything about it because, you know, really the culture there is that you're going to work for everything you get on the academic side. Nothing's going to be handed to you. And I respected that, and I enjoyed that aspect. Well, absolutely. It's it's something where you, you have that expectation, 
And uh, that's amazing because I did not know about, about Purdue. So, Matt, that's great lo- to look at universities where student is important, not just athlete, because, again, it gets a bad rap altogether, the whole NCAA. And then you never think of a school like that doing that. So that's a great, uh, I guess, plug for Purdue University and to say that, you know, if you're choosing a school based on academics and athletics, it sounds like it's a good choice for you. Yeah, you know, it always starts at the top too. You know, you know, they they got a heck of a president now. They, we had a heck of a president when I was there, and you know that 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 directive comes from the top down. And, and you know, really, you know, even even Coach Hazel and you know his new staff that's there this year, I, I, I can see it from them already that that's not just something they say. They truly walk the walk. Okay, so we go from we go specifically from there, and uh, we go into the whole situation with your you finally get you finally see you're going to be an NFL player. What happens next, Matt? Basically, you basically know that you're going to be a, a possible NFL player. It's your junior year when you figured this out. Yeah, I would say. I mean, look, we you know we we, we go and and uh, <laughs> kind of laid an egg in the Outback Bowl. Um, and and soon after that, you know, had a lot of, you know, agents that were trying to make the contact, you know, through a third party or however it works. And then, you know, you're going into your senior year and, and you start getting, you know, a lot more of attention from, you know, the different publications and things of that nature. Look, you know, I had I was lucky. I mean, I got to play with the Drew Brees of the world and, you know, an offensive line that, you know, literally gave up like seven sacks an entire season, you know, and, uh, you know, it just just with a with a great group of guys as a senior um, a collegiate athlete that you know we got a lot of attention and so basically went through the whole recruiting process um, from you know the agent perspective and and got to know that and started looking at it and saying hey you know this literally looks legit and before I knew it the draft was there I actually trained in Pittsburgh for two months at the UPMC Center so oh, wow. got a lot of familiarity with Oakland stayed in Oakland and. Uh, you know, trained in the Pittsburgh area. Um, I actually, my roommate, in my first year at Purdue was a was a Purdue guy. The Zatelli family, and and uh, had two two sons that played for Purdue from, you know, the the hardworking Zatelli family. Those guys are Pittsburgh through and through. And uh, but anyway, you know, basically went through that whole process, got ready for the draft, uh, went into the draft feeling great, and uh, you know, shoot, got got picked up, you know, midway through the second round. So. Um, great experience overall. Well, absolutely, a, a great experience. And now your dream that was really not not a dream, but I guess a shock in certain ways. You never thought in your whole life to say, "I'm going to play in the NFL," especially when you never watched a live game in the NFL. So basically, take us into this process. You get drafted, and then you go to the NFL, and you see. I think I honestly believe what helped you, Matt, to be such a successful player is I hear about how important it is to have the NFL brain and to understand things and understand things how they work, and especially in a workmanship position that you played in the NFL, it really helped to be a Purdue, a Purdue grad, wouldn't you agree, to, especially going into the Belichick system? Well, I mean, I think anytime it's your cerebral or you take, you know, that, that approach first and, and and you're willing to put the work in, I mean, that, that suits itself well to Bill's system and, you know, the Patriot way and everything else. But look, I mean, I came into an organization that, you know, again, I, I wasn't um, – versed on, you know, the history and everything else, you know, as some guys were, but I walked into it looking at it and saying, this is a great opportunity. I mean, you know, well, the first impression was this is the worst facility in the world, um, but they're building a new one, so I felt pretty good about that. But, you know, I looked at it and I said, you know, hey, look, here's a great opportunity. I mean, we got great owners. You can see that they're totally invested in, you know, this team and, and, and what we put on the field and what we do off the field. And, uh, you know, they had a great, uh, you know, the first thing I did when I got to New England was, you know, meet the Kraft family and, and see the work that they did within the community. And I just thought, you know, this is so much more than what I really thought it would be. Um, and then we go out and we had the success we had, you know, year one, won a Super Bowl as a rookie, you know, starting a left tackle, taking over for a guy in Bruce Armstrong that was one of the most, you know, just well-respected linemen in Patriot history. I mean, it was it was a lot to digest, but it was all good stuff. 
Okay, so when we get back, we'll go a little bit more into your career quickly and then go right into the foundation. You have a great story, Matt. Maybe you need to write a memoir someday because it seems like, especially when not many people will have that kind of story for the NFL. You're listening to the Beach Lifestyle Celebrity Segment on the Total Tutor Show, and we'll be back in just a moment. We're back to the Beach Lifestyle Celebrity Segment on the Total Tutor Show, TotalTutor.net for more information, Twitter, Total Tutor, Neil S. Haley, Facebook, and we're with Matt Light, and I mean, I would not have thought this, especially to hear about his story, hear about the student and student athlete, and and amazingly enough, getting to the Patriots and uh, preparing and getting the right break, and before you know it, you become a Super Bowl champion, so that must have been unbelievable. You know, it was. I mean, we were talking about, you know, another another big transition, you know, going from, you know, a guy that was literally living, you know, check to check, you know, based on what the university would give us and, you know, how we're going to scrounge up enough money to go out one night to, uh, you know, living that, that, that lifestyle, man. You're in the National Football League. You got a lot of attention. You know, you, you have a lot of success. Everything is going well. I got a wife that, you know, gave birth to our, our first child, you know, months after the, the big game. So there was a there's a lot to be thankful for, man. A lot to be proud of too. Okay, so let's go specifically uh from there. So you go on your career, three Pro Bowls, three Super Bowls, and when you decided life after football, were you ready? Did you say this is it's the time? Yeah, you know, look, I mean I was fortunate, you know, uh, my my eleven year career uh, played in the Super Bowl five times, lost the AFC Championship game, you know, once. I mean, did it all you every way you could do it. I mean, won it every way you could win it, lost it every way you could lose it. First round of the playoffs, second round of the playoffs, AFC Championship game. I mean, you name it. I mean, I just was able to do it with you know some of the best guys, you know, best guys on the planet. I was able to you know play the game with. So that was you know all in all a great career. And I looked at you know the lockout season. And uh, that freedom that, you know, we all enjoyed as players, which, you know, wasn't free. I mean, it, it definitely cost us a lot. But, you know, I look at that time and I said, this is what real life's about, you know. And uh, this is doing it on your own and not having all those comforts of, you know, the clubhouse and everything that's in the locker room and, the, and all the assistance that you get, you know, from training and everything else. And I said, man, I'm going to give it one last shot. Played, played my 11th season, you know. Darn near won it all again, and uh, and and was satisfied with you know kind of where I was at in life, and and ready to you know turn the page and go on to something bigger and you know maybe better. Who knows? <laughs> so basically, life after football led to this foundation. So tell us about the Matt Light Foundation and how surprisingly enough that once you get to work running a foundation, being involved in these other things, retirement doesn't seem like retirement. As you said, you're busy as can be. Yeah, it's been, it's just been, it's, it's been an amazing process, you know, going on year two of, uh, you know, being out of the league, the second season now, um, you know, where I haven't played and, uh, yeah, definitely settling into life after football and, and the foundation was something that, you know, look, after, after winning the Super Bowl in 2001, uh, 2002, you know, we, um, we formed this foundation and, and man, it's just, it's just transformed into something absolutely incredible. It's, it's, uh, it's the thing I'm probably the most proud of in my life, and and uh, the the work that we do, and the partnerships that we've you know forged over the years, and the impact that we've been able to make, you know, it's been has just been unbelievable to watch. And uh, you know, anybody that works with kids, and and uh, anybody that works with kids the way we do, and as for a long a period of time as we have, you um you know, look, it's like anything else. It's tough at times. It's you know, it's challenging. It's um, there's days you you wonder why you, you keep doing it, but the reward is always there somehow, some way. And uh, like I said, man, it's just something I'm truly passionate about. And, and we get kids in the outdoors. I mean, it's hard to put it in a nutshell. Um, MattLightFoundation.org gives you a lot of information. But, you know, we've got programs upon programs and programs that, you know, really get to the heart of what these kids go through. And it's not a one-hit wonder. We don't host a camp or do something for one day. I mean, we get these kids in the fold in some cases for four years and you really get to know them and you know that they put a lot into you and you put a lot into them and you know at the end of the day you walk away from it saying you know what we've made an impact in his life and 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 man he's made an impact in mine and and uh that's that's something that you 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 don't pay for that you got to experience it okay so you said you started the foundation about 2001 2002 the process when you first looked to start the foundation 
how, I guess we already know from your first part of the show why the outdoors. You love the outdoors. So putting that together to help kids, what a great mix. You know, it is. And listen, I mean, it's an awesome responsibility to do a lot of the things that outdoorsmen do. Um, you know, I use the outdoors because yeah, I've never heard anybody that walks outside and says, man, this sucks. You know, take a big, deep, you know, breath of air and, and you've been sitting in an office all day. I mean, people, human beings long to be outdoors. And so many of us don't get the opportunity to do that. And uh, even in my day-to-day life, you get so busy with sitting behind a desk or doing office-type work. Um, getting back to the roots of what really inspires me of being outdoors and, and sharing those experiences with young people and, and showing them a different way and, and using that to teach them lessons about responsibility and ethics and accountability and ultimately how to become leaders within their own communities and their own circles – that's just something that came naturally, and man, we we exploit the heck out of it, and and uh, it, it's it's really worked. And like I said, it's an awesome responsibility to go out and shoot a bow and arrow if a kid's never done it, and they'll do anything. I mean, they'll stay in line if I say I'm going to take that away if you guys keep messing up. You know, they're going to get in line, and it, it's a good incentive. But ultimately, it's just a great teaching tool. So you think that you develop structure and discipline through the outdoors because it's, it really teaches you patience. First of all, it also teaches you the ability to, to think on your feet because to survive in the outdoors is not always the easiest thing in the world. And it also only teaches, gets rid of some of the comforts of home and to understand adversity, right? Would you say all those things really are part of the foundation in ways? Yeah. You know, I think you hit it on the head and I think getting them, getting them outside their comfort zone is a big one. You know, look, you, you arrive from, uh, I think back to one of our groups from Tennessee, and, and we have these four young men that arrive in the middle of nowhere, Ohio, you know, cornfields all around them, woods, crazy sounds, mosquitoes, ticks, you know, all the stuff that you enjoy as an outdoorsman. And they're, they're literally sitting there just wondering, how in the world did I ever get myself into this? And two days later, you know, you see them come out of their shell. And, you know, two years later, you see them just, you know, truly enjoy every moment that they're in camp, you know, around all their people. And it's a safe place and it's a sacred place. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's everything you mentioned. And then some, wow. So what types of kids are involved in the foundation? Which ones do you look at to work with? Are they, uh, uh, areas that have never been outdoors before? A lot of times the kids you're finding to be involved in this. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's a good question. It's an interesting one, too, and, and how we view it is probably a little different than other organizations. But we really, you know, we target these kids. I say that they uh, they might have set the house on fire, but they didn't burn it down. You know, I, it, my, my clinical term is knucklehead. But um, what, what I really like to say is that, you know, look, um, we, we go after these kids that teachers and guidance counselors and uh, people that run organizations like the Boys and Girls Club and any after-school program, the ones that actually work with them, they would look at you and say, you know, this kid isn't a bad kid, or he's a, he's a decent kid, but, you know, he needs to have a little direction, needs to have somebody in his life, you know, needs a program like yours to really keep him on track, because a lot of these kids are from single-parent homes, lower, you know, you know, socioeconomic background. I mean, it's just a, it's just a lot of things that a lot of people suffer from, and they're not all like that. I wouldn't put, it wouldn't be a blanket statement to say that, you know, all of our kids are like this, and they're all from the inner city. Some of them aren't, some of them are and, uh, you know, the best part about that is you get all these kids from all these various backgrounds. You put them in the middle of the woods, put, bring them in from all over the country, not just one area. And they all realize that, hey, man, we all suffer from the same things. And we all view life the same way in some ways. And we're different in others. And, you know, it just really works. The model really works. So tell me some success stories of your program since you started it. Well, you know, I, I look I look at each and every kid that we work with. And I, and I say somewhere there's a success. Now, uh, in saying that, we've had many kids that, haven't been able to fulfill some of the different programs. And we have many different programs, but the one that I always key in on and the one that we really, um, that, that I take, I mean, I take pride in all of them, but the one that I really enjoy is our leadership camp. It's called Camp Bohoicus, and it's where we bring these kids in. They spend four years in our program. Um, we make a big commitment. They make a big commitment. And at the end of the day, you see these wide-eyed, you know, somewhat troubled, um, you know, just riddled with all kind of little holes from, you know, things in their life that have been difficult that they had to overcome or hadn't been able to overcome. And four years later, you know, they walk away making great decisions, having a game plan for life, you know, um, staying in contact, asking to come back and become counselors and, and just really taking the right steps. And when you see that happen firsthand, and again, you've built that relationship over years. 
and we built that relationship over years. I mean, you just you can't re, you can't replace it. I mean, you can't. Uh, it's just it's so hard to um, find that in in other things. And and when you see it firsthand, I mean, that that's a success story. I mean, you see that kid go from you know shy, awkward, you know maybe insecure, un, unsure of their future to really truly having that game plan. It's it's awesome to see, man. Each and every time. Never gets old. Well, and, and I'm sure the passion you have, Matt, especially when you got to retire, how much more hands-on you're involved in the foundation, right? Yeah, it's great. You know, I just got back from Ohio. We're back out here on the East Coast, and, you know, we spend the whole summers there. And, and, you know, most of that time is working with these kids and running these camps. And, you know, after two weeks in the woods, you, you look forward to having, you know, air-conditioned home and, and the you know comforts of uh of, of the you know quote unquote real world but um it's it's a, it's a magical time man it's a, it's an unbelievable uh um just just moment that that we all get to share and and it is sacred man it's 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 been great we uh i uh taught at a leadership camp in Tunkhannock, Pennsylvania. It's right outside of uh, in the Poconos. And, and without electri- there was electricity, but a lot of the creature comforts weren't there, and I really learned a lot. And it really gets you to think about all they just do is do activities. Lots of fun activities from sports to outdoorsmen and all these different things where you're away from everything else. The television, all these things, and it really, the kids learn so much from this. I really believe that. Yeah, you do, man. And it's, you know, from playing paintball and getting to shoot shoot each other, you know, with, with some paint to, you know, riding dirt bikes and then doing career educational tours and, and camp projects and things like that. It's just, it's, um, you know, it's, it's an experience that, you know, these kids truly, you know, they, they, they truly love it. And, uh, and we do too, man. We get as much as they do out of it. So Matt, what, what is your ultimate goal of the foundation? Where do you want to see it go? You know, uh, right now we're working hard to uh, just really be able to long-term, you know, and and when I say long-term, I I hope I mean, you know, seven generations of uh, young lights to come, you know, a hundred generations, whatever it is, till the end of time, right? Let's think big here. But, you know, put this, this foundation in a position where we will survive forever because we have a system in which, you know, we can, we can win at all times. And that comes down to basically, you know, going out there and continue to do the work we do, raise the money to fund how we do the things that we do, but always have this 600-acre facility open that not only we can use as a foundation, but we have so many other nonprofits that use it year-round. It's always booked. And uh, to just continue that uh, process and make sure that it's always there. So um, it's been, a, like I said, it's been a dream of mine and, and my, my family and all the people that have worked hard on it. So you know, we're going to make sure that, uh, you know, even when we're long gone, that this thing will be open and those opportunities will still exist. That's fantastic. So where can our listeners donate and learn more about the foundation, Matt? Oh, it'd be great. You know what? We've got a Donate Now button on our website, which is mattlightfoundation.org. And uh, you can also check out, you know, our programs, our events, and the different things that we do. We have one huge signature event that we have coming up. It's our Celebrity Shootout. We've been, this is our ninth year. It's an unbelievable event. It's where we really get all of our funding to do what we do and it's uh, basically getting you know all my former teammates and other local celebrities uh to come out and do a sporting clays tournament we make things blow up it's golfing with a shotgun so between the events that we do and our website donate now button um that that's how people can get involved and check out who we are and and uh you know support support what we do well matt uh best of luck to you love to have you back to tell tell us more about the foundation another time and uh ways that we can get involved so thanks again for calling matt I appreciate it. All the best to you, and uh, and and you know what? I'll even say I hope I hope your Steeler Nation does well this season. They they were always fun to go up against. See, Matt, you're not playing anymore. You could say that you would get a lot of heat if you're still playing for the Patriots. So thanks for calling. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, take care. Okay, bye bye. You're listening to the Total Education Celebrity Show on the Total Tutor Network, and we'll be back in just a moment. 